Seems like everyone in here is a really good debater. So, oh, well, yeah, we'll keep going with that assumption. And uh, so I think we just are going to get like a little deeper into some things in which I think is problematic for when you get to like beginning level uh, open, beginning level junior to mid level, and then going from there to like more like elite level PMRs, which I think, uh, which are very small differences, but very big differences. So the um, like small things go a long way to me, and partly especially towards the top as you move up. One of the big things I learned is that when you are debating, there's a difference between trivializing your opponent's arguments or making light of your opponent's arguments and then flat out like denying their existence, right? Like we just had a debate round against a very good open level team, which I think will be awesome next year. And they would say stuff like, oh, they did not address our, uh, our small warrant of like Australia. When it was like addressed, okay? Like it was talked about and it was addressed. So instead of making the distinction like they didn't talk about Australia, you wanna make the comparative claims, right? So. In that round, we were talking about how the economies are resilient or not resilient, and they talked about how, like Vancouver, I think it was, and Australia have had uh, some economic shocks that hurt the economy, so decreased econ. So then, uh, in the uh, in, in the MO and the block, we said like these are too small, right? I said, uh, yeah, just because they stopped having cannabis clubs in Vancouver doesn't mean that's the same as the United States economy and manufacturing. Like, I'm pretty sure the United States is just a bigger economy and it's more resilient. And in Australia, I'm like, yeah, you know, the kangaroo meat market might have hurt the economy. But overall, Australia is not a superpower. California's economy is about five times larger than Australia, right? So when in the PMR, like, just for example, I can't spell. So in the PMR, instead of being like, look, they didn't address like our, speci our, our specific warrants on the economy uh, of you know, Vancouver and what happened in Australia, so obviously we can control uniqueness in the direction, like make that comparison. And I think when you make those comparisons, and you use because it's smarter, like, look, we give you very unique examples on how the green tech sector in Vancouver and the green tech sector in Australia caused a, a big problem for the overall health of those economies. And we, we're showing you how this technology alone is enough to hurt you know, economies to scale. So whether it's a small economy, the scale of the economy made a big difference. So yeah, they're gonna come up here and they said some big like the same, it's like the United States economy is big. Yeah, dude, like I think everyone can agree that the United States economy is big, but it's not you know, a fail safe. We're showing that this unique thing can still hurt a gigantic economy, or think about it, if you lost you know, a couple thousand jobs in Vancouver from something uh, that small, can you imagine, times that by the 380 million people in America, you know, that then is now a gigantic portion or population of people. Now you have some magnitude claims, you have, uh, you, you have um, comparison claims, and that just goes a, longer, like a long way. Because if you're a judge, and you're in the back, and like, yo, they dropped their Vancouver warrants, and we control uniqueness. Judge is like, well, not really. You didn't. Also, I think before round, you should always ask your your judges, how do you feel about stuff that's not said in the MO? Okay, because some judges, it's kind of a weird thing, because everything that's said in the MO, you don't want to repeat in an LOR. But at the same time, does that mean that it is dropped if it's not said in the LOR? And some judges will say no. Everything in the MO is definitely being evaluated in the debate round. Other judges will say yes, but only to the point in which the LOR weighed or framed that into the debate, right? And those are very good distinctions in which you want to talk about because you do not want to have, say, look, the MO dropped it, and the judge is like, dude, you can't drop stuff. And, you know, just because of, just because the LOR dropped an MO argument doesn't mean it's out of the debate round. All of a sudden, your claim means nothing. Right? So it's a very easy thing to do, very easy for you to weigh out. Um, the second thing in the PMR you want to do is make sure to answer all new arguments out of the block. Right? I like to answer um, all new arguments. I like to go down a row and compare. Um, there's a couple ways you can do this. 
first thing um, you can do is you can frame, right? So you can frame arguments. Uh, this is this is very efficient. If you know how you want to frame the debate round, so if you want to like go towards like environment, you have some try or die scenarios, right? To where it doesn't matter what happens in the round uh, about the economy, it doesn't matter about anything. All that matters is the environment. Then you can say, look, they give a shit ton of new examples in the MO about the economy, group them all together, and realize that the economy is probably dependent on there being a world or, you know, a habitable place for human beings. And so all those new arguments, it doesn't matter. That is a secondary issue in this debate round. The first thing that we're resolving is going to be the environment. So you just framed out all of those new arguments, and that's a really like efficient way to do it, is to try to frame them out first. Then you want to go to the stuff that is within the way you frame it, so your environmental answers, and then attack all of those new arguments uh, line by line as much as you can right, quickly. Um, and that's important. Do you guys have any questions on that? It's pretty straightforward, I think. Cool. Can you repeat that or do you have examples? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so say you have an advantage on the environment, right? And then you have uh, advantage two is something like the economy. And the MO, so you're the you're the government, remember you're like you're the government team. So the MO after the LO just like puts like a bunch of arguments here on the environment and they're all brand new. Okay? The bunch. But the economy, look like you have a drop to uniqueness stories, you have you drop links, and you have some pretty badass impacts, you're probably not gonna go for the environment in the PMR because you want to start like siphoning your strategy down, right? So what you can do. So you can say judge. Instead of going through here and being like, I'm going to answer all of these in a row, you can say judge. Like, we're definitely winning because the economy is more important than the environment because we have some sort of claim stating that we have 7 billion people on the earth and unless we have some sort of practices to conserve, which is through the economy or through capitalism or whatever, we cannot uh, sustain humanity or the environment. Okay. So that means the environment is now less important in the economy. Does that make sense? So then you can say take all of these new arguments here, group all of the MOs, awesome, sweet, block arguments on the environment, and just realize that they're just not important in this round because while they might be good, none of them impact the economy and they're all secondary. That way you don't have to answer them all line by line. And then you would hit the ones that are on the economy that are specific to winning the round. Does that, no, is that better? Yeah. Okay, cool. After you do the line by line, um, I think the other thing too is it's about being the part where I was talking about being honest about like both sides of the round is you want to sit there and you want to start um, comparing how pieces of paper interact. The better the debate rounds are, the less you have clear cut wins, right? Like you're just not going to get in a good round and just completely have some team waxed on every piece of paper where they're just losing everything. Right? So if you have like the AF team, right, has environment and economy, and the negative team has something like relations and uh, some sort of, I don't know, North Korea nuke scenario, and then some sort of CP, you don't want to sit there and just say, like, look, like, we're winning this, this, we're winning this, and we're winning this, and we're winning this, because you're not gonna win them all. But you can make strategic concessions. You can sit there and use framing and show how you can frame them out of these positions. So even if you think they're winning relations, this is all predicated on the, um, you know, our economic peace theories or the democratic peace theories, one of those things. So what's more important is it, for relations is that we keep having commerce or keep having trade or we keep going to economic uh, or environmental like um, like seminars or protocols together and joint and joint ventures, uh, and that is like that comes first, right? And that will help you to look at that. Also, you have impact comparison, so you want to talk about stuff like that. You know, sometimes they'll be like, "We need to save a lot of money" or something like that, or 
North Korea nuclear war, and that's where you want to say stuff like, yeah, they're, this is where you use magnitude. You got a big dick impact, right? But you have very low probability of oh, interrupting your court. I mean, big stick. <laughs> stick. So, you know, you can say something like a big stick impact, but you have very low um, likelihood, right? Or really low probability. Judge, you're going to prefer the likelihood of our environmental class when we have very specific uniqueness points saying that the Himalayans are melting, or some climatologists said that, you know, the, Maldi the Maldives, uh, if they, if, if the, what is it, I think it's if the world heats up by like another three centigrade, the water levels will rise and can literally wipe out the Maldives islands, which leads to climate refugees. And we have no international policy on climate refugees. And that does a couple of things. The first thing that can do is that you're gonna wipe out an, an indigenous population, right? Like, that's pretty easy to weigh out, right? And probably something that'd be hard to solve from a counter plan or from one of these advantages. Like, you can talk about how that would short circuit the advantage. So if you have something about climate refugees and the environment, and they're running relations, you can talk about the fiasco it creates to have to disperse or give, uh, put a populations of human beings in other nations when we do not have any protocols right now. That would lead to massive amounts of chaos. There'd be problems. Um, usually, uh, we don't treat refugees very well in this world. We treat them like, like shit, you know what I mean? And so you can talk about how that is bad, uniquely bad, and how that would lead to worse relationships or other problems. So it's comparisons, right? Uh, any questions on that? Cool. The next thing uh, is time frame. Time frame is cool. So will Chamberlain explain time frame in a really cool way to me, in which you can, it's like link turn or no link arguments in, in the PMR. I guess you could do an LOR too, it's just for both of those. But the PMR is the best one because you have less it. And the way in which you do that is you talk about the time frame of your impacts. That's why um, when I do in, in my impact scenarios, I try to have, like from the beginning, I try to have what's called horizontal link stories and vertical impact stories. And what that means is that each one of my, my links can get me to the impact story. And then my impact stories go from very probable, very likely, and start ramping up until you get to, you know, nuclear war or, you know, the world explodes or or something like really bad, right? So when you say horizontal link stories, do you mean that they all get you to the impact, like they yep. get to the impact and then you go down the impact yep. from scales? Okay. Exactly, so each individual link can get me to the, link, to the impact, so I don't have to have all of them work, right? So each individual one works. Then what you can do is say someone says, dude, we're not going to nuke war, and you're like, probably, probably right. But you drop the fact that a small resource for it can lead to self incursion, which would lead to things like sexual assault or, you know, giving children guns and pumping them full of drugs to shoot people. And that is very likely, specifically when we have stuff like the LRA or other small groups or, uh, you know, a good warrant on it, right? Then you can use time frame, right? You can say, look, as soon as you trigger the link, the time frame of when, uh, you know, these civil incursions happens is so quick, right? that this completely changes the landscape of the relations disadvantage. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. like, we just created a disaster, so like, your uniqueness is now, a diff is now changed, right? This disaster would then make it so relations are gonna be worse, or you know, they're gonna be unfixable, or it's gonna be the point where you know, it will lead to different forms of cooperation that would be outside of this, and it's ways you can just short circuit a disaster. Does that need to be coming out in the MG, or can you start doing that in the PM? Like, you know what I mean? Do you need to be explaining how they interact a little bit in the MG so that they can go for that in the PMR, or do you think? That, I would say two things. First, it depends on the judge. Um, a lot of judges will be okay if you frame it as time frame, right? You say, look, this is a time frame argument. Some will, and the other thing is, is how do you handle point of orders, right? If someone point of orders you, don't go like this. Well, pfft. McGuire said it like in his MG somewhere, right? Like that is very, very bad, right? What I want is you want to have your partner point to an argument somewhere on a piece of paper. Hopefully it's the actual argument, like obviously. Then you want to say, 
Judge, I want you to go to uh, advantage number two. I will actually go to impact number two, where uh, McGuire specifically states that the economy is the internal link to environmental protection policies, which I feel that these policies then supersedes this, right? Uh, well, I'm thinking about when you said, when you talk about that it basically kills the uniqueness of the, the set. Does that need to be coming out in the MG, or can you say the analysis was like, well, hard impacts already show obviously hard impacts happen, this happened, yeah. so all I'm doing is. I mean, yeah, you can, but a lot of times if you think your judge can drive with it, and that's why you have your judge play philosophy notebook, uh, then I wouldn't. Okay. Just because it's a time frame comparison of arguments, and that's where you want to say things like, I'm not changing the direction of their link, I'm not changing the manner of our argumentation, I'm just showing you how different pieces of paper interact okay. with each so other. So this time frame every time. Right, yeah. Yes. Okay. But yeah, if you can do it in MG, that's cool. Sometimes it's cool to kind of leave some some tricks to the that's, PMR that's as well. So it, I mean, it's something you want to kind of get a grasp with. It also depends on how judges like you or not. It depends on how they feel about that type of stuff. And those are good questions to ask. Um, also use magnitude, right? Uh, there's always the, I'm not a big fan of the 1% risk argument. You know, like even if there's like a 1% risk that uh, you know, a nuclear war happens, you vote here. I think that if you have to go to 1%, you're probably having the wrong link stories or the wrong impact stories. I mean, you wanna talk about things like, in the world, I think this statistic is on every single day, there's something like a 33 or 34% chance that we nuke ourselves. So I think 1% is drastically like, underestimating our own powers. And, and so, I mean, you can sit there and you wanna talk about that, be like, look, we're not talking about some weird 1%, you know, generic nuclear war scenario. We're talking about a very specific one where we've been close to the triggers before to where these two countries have some sort of inequality to where nuclear weapons are the only option left. And this is what's going to happen. So, I mean, yeah, they're claiming, you know, the LOR stated that this is low probability. We're telling you not only is it like it has a strong probability, but as a strong magnitude, and when you have both of those factors together, you know, that's something you want to look towards, right? Or, you know, like if we're doing economy, you're like, look, um, economic downturn is a lot more likely and a lot more probable, and when we see the effects every time we have that downturn, and they're A, B, and C, and if every single time we tried to pass a policy that could help the economy, we said, oh no, wait, we might get a nuclear war with outer Bangladesh, or can you imagine what our economy would look like, right? And then you would sit there and say, obviously we're gonna put that small like risk in the, in the back seat and we're gonna go towards these. And then you couple those with, you know, economic democratic peacekeeping, two countries that are, uh, have capitalist ties together or trade together, strengthen bonds, you can have, you know, sticky power arguments. I mean, this is where you pull out arguments throughout the flow to help your cause. Um, theory. Theory is cool, right? Theory in the PMR, um, I feel is tough. Yeah. What do you think of the cleanest way to talk about two arguments that are basically the same? Like if, if there's a disadvantage of that. They both get the same impact? Yeah, and like there's arguments on both sheets that you draft. Okay, so yeah. But the first thing you want to do in a situation, okay, so she said what happens if the, the advantage and the disad are similar yeah. and the impacts are similar? Then the argument, what you want to do then is you want to concede as much of the similarity as possible. So if the uniqueness is the same, you'd be like, cool, like we, the uniqueness is the same, obviously this is the direction. The impact is the same, which is nuclear war or economic collapse. Our difference is now lie in the link level, okay? And then, you would just uh, kind of get out of uniqueness, right? So uniqueness is agreed on, impacts are agreed on, and then you want to kind of go line by line through the two link levels, and then you're going to start comparing them, right? Their link story is that we do this, and it probably goes this way, right? It probably says, like, there's some sort of turn saying that we make it worse, but they drop these two links, which are tougher, and go, uh, you know, which soft word. That's also a good reason why you have horizontal links, 
because usually if you have you know four or five links or if you have a link in like four or five internal links they will answer a good portion of them but they will probably drop one most times and that's where you can say look they did a great job answering five of the six of our link levels unfortunately when every single individual link can grant, get to our impact scenario that one drop is devastating. Now let me show you how that one uh, link story is now the biggest thing in the round. And then you compare that one link story to maybe their five, right? And then hopefully you answer most of theirs. And then you can show how either one of two things, either their link stories are, uh, like need to be in, how do you say, all have to work together to get to impact, like they're vertical, or how your link story is like more probable, more likely, right? You want to talk about those things, more feasible, and also you want to get into a, a comparison of the warrants, right? So their warrants are this, this, and this. These are bad warrants because, which is proven by my MG. Our warrants are this, this, and this, which are much better. That is also proved by my MG. Now we'll all show you why. So if you compare this one to this one, ours is better because. That's why I always like, they said this, we said this, Ours is better because. I think the because is really lacking from a lot of debates. And that comparison uh, gets you that extra little depth or even think of it as like a reason to prefer your warrant or reason for, to prefer your argument over the other teams. Is that cool? All right, let's do a little theory. So um, I'm gonna start. I'm just gonna go with, with T at first. If you have questions on other specific theory um, ideas, let me know a second. And this kind of goes for both the PMR and the LOR. Um, I found it very hard in the LOR to. What do you say to T that wasn't just said in the M, right? <laughs> I mean, and conversely. Uh, with the PMR, it's very hard to figure out what to do. Um, obviously, in the PMR, the difference is, is you're going to answer everything that was new in the block. But there's a couple of questions that you need to answer. The first is uh, on the interpretation level. So the first one is, is there an interp? Second is, is it any good? And why, right? And this is if we're mostly going for, you're going for it, okay? Like, obviously, if you're not going for T, and, you know, you don't think the other team is winning T, you just want to make sure that you cover the new answers and then give reasons why not to go for it. But if this is a T battle and you have to win T, these are the arguments that you want. Cool? All right. Is there an interpretation? Is it any good? And why it is good? You bring up the resolution, make that comparison. The next, is there a counter interp? And in the PMR, this is where you want to say that your counter interp is not only really good, but also that it is competitive and different than the interpretation. Because if your counterinterpretation is not competitive, you're in a lot of trouble in the debate round. And that's a really good distinction for LORs to make. You know, look, look their counterinterpretation sucks because, like, with our interpretation, you can do whatever their counterinterpretation is. Next is going to be um, GOV standards, or sorry, OP standards. And in the PMR, you want to say how your counterinterpretation meets these standards or is better within these standards. Then you want to claim it. So, like, if the opposition standard is something about limits, you want to talk about how they say you need to underlimit. You can say why you're underlimiting, or conversely, you say they say limits. We are winning the argument that you must overlimit the resolution because. When you have one single topic that is the best for the division of ground, 
also the most predictable ground, something of that nature. So you want to you want to meet those standards, or show why they're best. You're the LOR, just the opposite, right? We have our standards; they're amazing. The counter interp doesn't have them, and that's the other thing you can compare. Another thing I think that isn't used very much in a PMR that's very strategic. Why is the um, the opposition interpretation? Why they don't meet their own standards? A lot of times, you know, people in prep just write down the T's that idiots and you know people just say stuff or they just put together shells and they're like, let's just use standards. And you start thinking like, what's a good standard? And they'll say like limits or they'll say ground and they haven't really thought about like does their interpretation actually meet their own standards? And I think that there's a lot of good answers there. Fifth thing you want is you want to talk about your counter standards. Now, if reasonability is a counter standard, I would leave this um, a little further down. But I, I definitely think you would at least want to have maybe like one counter standard that is um, debate specific. Um, because I think reasonability is more of a way in which to evaluate the, the, the topicality as opposed to a standard. I mean, some people will say some stuff like counter standard reasonability, like we must, all we have to do is win one standard and prove that there's no articulated views to win. I think that's kind of a weird, I don't think that's a standard, I think that's an evaluation, like measure, basically. So I think like counter standards, there's like creativity, debatability, you can have a whole slew of counter standards. And you wanna say, not only what your counter standard is, but you wanna say how your counter interpretation meets that standard. And you wanna also state how the original interpretation out of the LOC does not meet that counter standard. And the last is voters. And I think that in both sides, it might not be strategic to always go for both. I mean, it usually comes down to either education or fairness for the most part. And I think that going for both is tough. I think that you have a better job of going for one or the other, and I think that there should be substantial arguments made by both either MO or MG of why you should value either fairness and or education, um, and then that's where you want to make those, you want to frame those arguments as well. So that's where you hear things like fairness is a prior question to education because if we don't know the rules of the game, then there's no way we'd be able to have a clash in the game. Or Education is more important because if we don't have education in the round, then we don't learn anything and everyone gets pissed because it's just a dumb activity, it's not academic, blah, 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 right? Education before fairness. And that's where you want to start, you want to make those distinctions. Then I think after that, I would go into reasonability versus um, competing interpretations. Schmidt and I disagree very heavily when he says that, you know, you need to say, like, we meet the counter-interpretation. I think, like, obviously you should meet your counter-interpretation. Uh, that's all I think you say. The other thing I think we disagree on is that competing interpretations, like, sometimes people will say, like, oh, you didn't say competing interpretations, so we got default to reasonability. I think that's not very persuasive because any time you have a counter-interpretation and an interpretation, What's the judge supposed to do with that? Like, well, there's two. Obviously, I'm going to compare them, right? So you need to say, like, yes, we should compare them, like, obviously, but I don't think that means that it's either competing interpretation or reasonability, right? Like, reasonability is a part of competing interpretations. Like, you can make that argument. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, obviously, we're going to compare the two interpretations. We're just saying, like, it's got to be pretty effing bad of a violation of topicality before you vote on the two interpretations. Like if, if we show our counter interpretation, which we meet, it's clo either close enough to the original interpretation or close enough to the resolution, these are both reasons why you don't vote on T. And obviously the last thing, which is ridiculous, is like RBIs, right? Like you want your partner to have talked about it, but if there's an RBI and they're going deep on it, I think you gotta, you gotta talk about it. It's called a reverse voting issue. Um, it's where if there's a topicality being run, 
MG at this last answer on voter on voters will say, look, when you have a first voting issue, that if they kick the tea, then it's not genuine, and you should vote them down because they're destroying education by running frivolous procedurals, which like makes debate dumb or something like that. So if you put an RBI down there and the other team doesn't address it, you can go for it. It's a cheap shot, right? Or you know, it just needs to be addressed. Most of the times. You can just say why it's not a voter, right? Or you can just say why it goes somewhere else. So the RBI comes and which speech? Maybe the MG. Not uh, specifically if it's like uh, if you're an LOR. Do you think you should be putting those on as MG that much? Or do you think they're kind of troublesome because then they have to collapse the T so if you don't want to debate T, you just yeah. put yourself in the box? Yeah, pretty much. If you want to debate T, like an RBI is cool, but even if you want to debate T, I don't even think it's strategic either because if you don't put an RBI, they'll probably undercover T a little bit more, right? And then if you want to go for T as an evaluation or something like that, you can do it that way, like bait them into it a little bit. But yeah, I think RBIs just are mo mostly just not not a practice you see a lot of. You see a lot in the North North Circuit that you're in. Uh, RBI. I guess Chief shots because people don't flow that well. And then some judges think that T is a reverse voting issue if you tell them it is. Judge adaptations. No. Know your judges, right? How about Judge Philosophy book? Okay. Yeah, because they um, write those in NorCal. Now let's talk about the critique. Now, if you're a straight up team, and you know you're hitting a critical team, there's a couple things that you want to do before you even get your PMR, and that would be you want to have some sort of critical advantage or critical impact modules that you can try to uh, weigh against the critique, right? Um, I think that... Okay, so if you run a case that you're going to um, green energy, yeah, increase green tech, right? And you have like the first advantage is gonna be something like uh, economics, and the second one could be like the environment, right? That's pretty standard for you so far. What you can do is you gotta do something like talk about how the economy um, is what is necessary for tax dollars, and that tax money goes to things like funding education or, or the ability to have um, like Planned Parenthood for women's choices, or it helps you know put money into special programs that helps out. You know, it's more like systemic impacts, right? So, it helps things like poverty. It helps people who are oppressed. It helps trying to shine the light on. Um, oppressed persons. You can also do a plan where you help, like, you know, allow for, you know, indigenous lands to be able to sell or use their own green technology and then run stuff about uh, indigenous sovereignty as an advantage. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. So it's just like an impact. So you have an economy, right? Like, increase the money, which is normal. And then have your second impact, like increase like funding to like a specific group or a specific systemic impact. You can talk about how it's good to stop for starvation because you can, you know, people can have food and that stops things like food scarcity. Food scarcity is important because that's where uh, children don't know where their next meal comes from and it leads to massive amounts of anxiety. It hurts their ability to have, get to be able to like learn and have retention in school, which then traps them into this cyclical uh, cyclical poverty, which is uniquely dehumanizing because, you know, when you cannot not make your personal system better, then you get trapped and that's horrible. Or anxiety is bad, it's like high levels of anxiety over long periods of time leads to PTSD. PTSD is uniquely bad because um, there's no cure for it. So you're increasing the amount of people who are getting, you know, diagnosed with incurable diseases, like that can be something you can talk about. Because then, if you have a critique like, fuck capitalism, right, like cap's bad, and you're like, well, 
yeah, you say like some parts are bad, but we can frame you out of the debate now with a critical advantage. You can say, yes, capitalism is bad, I guess, if you look at it as a huge, like horrible institution, but one, we probably, uh, obviously not a permanent, like, but you're gonna say, you know, we saw better because we are a new conceptualization of capitalism through fiat, which shows that we can use it in order to help uh, groups who are pushed to the periphery in the system now, right? And that's kind of how you can frame those arguments. I also like to use like a realism inevitable shell on top yeah. of that, just kind of like, well, if people are gonna be realistic, then the firm is probably the best idea because it kind of converges those two ideas. Yeah, for sure, I'll make it to the firms in just a second, but yeah, definitely. So I would definitely try to have some sort of critical impact or critical impact or critical advantage that you can go to. Um, next thing you want is hopefully your MG did a good job and read some perms. So you want to go over the perms, right? And the reason why you want to go over the perms is I think a lot of times the MG puts out a good shell. You know, perm, do both. Perm, do plain and all non kind of competitive parts of the alternative, right? Stuff like that. But what the F does that mean, right? This is where as a PMR, you're just gonna start knocking that shit home, you know? You're like, look, we're allowed to pass plan, increase de green technology, and then decide to reconceptualize capitalism. What does this mean? This means there's no reason why we can't have more green and green energy stuff being produced in the, in the short term. And long term, we can all have this wonderful discussion about the negative effects of evil people who love capitalism, right? What's the net benefits? Like, look, when we have this uh, dichotomy working together, then we have things like uh, polyphonic discourse where we have multiple viewpoints coming into, uh, like basically coming together to make new practices of change. It's only when we have these contradicting ideologies that we can come up with synthesis, you come up with uh, special ways to solve for complex problems. This net benefit cannot be garnered by the critique alone. Then you weigh it. We can now weigh this individual net benefit, which not only solves all of the critique, but also we get case solvency, and on top of that, we have the best way and the step to do it. You can also say things like, because these perms, it shows that the alternative is insufficient, right? The alternative alone raises the questions, the plan solves it, therefore, only through the perm can you get real solvency because we can actually do something about the problem. How do you phrase that with the idea at the same time that the perm is uh, only a test of competition, so that you don't put all your eggs into the... I mean, it's, it's, still, it's, 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 always, it's still a, a test of competition, it's just showing what that world looks like, right? Okay. So you're saying, like, the critique raises like certain problems, right? Uh, the alternative or the conceptualization of the alternative solves it, right? But you probably have arguments saying that it doesn't solve it, okay? That's the first that's the first half of the world. Within that same world as a test of competition, you have the plan, right? And you want the plan to be sort of like the direction. The direction or how you can solve for the problems associated to the critique. Now they're still separate, you're not advocating the both of them together, but when you look at this world holistically, the impacts can still be solved and merged. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just thinking about, so like yeah, the perm's a better idea and you can read a shitload of good, you know, perm, perm's the best option, but then where should you put the rest of your, where you're also going to like weigh out is, if the perm really is the best option, where else should you be putting your, you know, weight in the case, if that makes sense? Or should you go, because you shouldn't go all in on perms, it seems like, or do you think you I mean, I, I, we do quite, I mean, the thing is, you, the perm should get you something, right? Like, if, if you're just saying perm to make you equal to the critique, you're not doing it very well, right? So that's where you need to start talking about, what are the net bends? and what are the impacts of those net benefits, which makes the perm better 
than the critique itself, right? Yeah, but you don't think it, can, do you think it's okay in the PMR to just sit on the perm the end, most, like the entire speech? I mean, it, if it's one of the things where if the perm solves, like if you, you know the perm solves almost all of the critique, then yes. Okay. All because right. either, and especially because a lot of times the alternatives, especially if it's a counterpoint alternative, they'll probably solve most of case, or, or root, even if they have root cause arguments, right? Say you drop a root cause argument. One thing that you can do that's kind of tricky is say, like, our perm solves for the root cause argument. We solve the root, root cause through this, and once the root cause is solved, then we also get the impacts of the perm. And so you want to kind of start leveraging those arguments. So all we need to do is win this perm, and we solve the root cause, and we still get all these extra net benefits. Um, I also think you need to work on the framework, though, too. Okay. Like you need to have like specific inroads on the framework, and why the framework allows for the perm. Also, I think in framework, you can frame out the critique a lot of times. If you, you know or the impacts of the critique, because a lot of times people, frameworks are kind of funny, because like, I feel like a lot of times the frameworks will only say, like we should look at discursive impacts, or we should look at certain speech hacks, or we should do something at this stage, or I, th I think a lot of times you can, you can just say, okay, you know, like you want to have answers to why your PMC is a speech hack. Like, why they try to silence your speech act, you know, and you can have an independent voting like, reason of why by silencing your PMC and your personal speech act, that, that is bad. Also, probably turns to critique because they say discursive, uh, you know, discourse is the most important thing, and then they try to like destroy your own ability to have discourse in the round. Um, you can also say, cool, like discursive impacts, like we both have them. So what does this come down to? It comes down to net benefits. You can still use net benefits and say we have the net benefits as a fiat because fiat. If they say fiat is illusory, like, wow. That is brand new news to me. I thought after I passed this green tech plan, like all of a sudden magically outside, solar panels would just start popping up on buildings everywhere, right? Like obviously fiat is illusory, but you probably have some answers to why role playing is good, right? And so role playing is good, and you go over those answers again. Like we, we prove role playing is good. They don't have answers of why our role playing acts are not as important as their discursive acts, because they're both the same, they're both, you know, the same thing. And then say, so we got to look at the impacts on net benefits, right? Let's try to get that lens. Or you can say stuff that, I mean, my favorite thing is to say why their framework is not competitive. I think critiques have a big problem with that. A lot of times they say we have to look at the source of impacts so that we can shine a light on those who are oppressed or those who have no voice or no who's like that. Be like, yeah, dog, well, my MC did a really baller job telling you why. You can run a critical advantage, i.e. we have one, it is advantage one, so there's no reason why I couldn't run a critical advantage with critical impacts to shine light on these populations, or you can run things like actor disads, right, you can, from the United States federal government, and that's Satan, I'm pretty sure you can run a disad from the United States federal government doing this action is Satan, right? You're not competitive. You're not saying why we can only have the discursive impacts of the opposition in this debate, this debate round, right? Um, really, really good K debaters will have answers to that, and that's where you want to compare them. Like they're going to say that you know our rep representations are problematic, but what are the links to those representations? You want to bring those up? Like they'll say stuff to like your representation of capitalism is evil and blah 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 blah, blah and be like, no, I like that's a link of omission. You're talking about like really bad capitalism now. I'm pretty sure our green technology is under the representation of funding indigenous populations' abilities to self-sustain and grants and uh, you know get back so that they have sovereignty of their land. That is a gigantic shift from the representations of capitalism we have now, and that seems to me like a link of omission, right? So you want to make those sort of comparatory claims a lot, very specific claims, kind of systematically. Hedge against the K. Um, I think a lot of times too, at the end of the debate rounds, we would just straight impact turn. You can straight impact turn a lot of critiques. And if you want to straight impact turn a critique, most of the times you can just say stuff that like, look, at the end of this debate round, if there is no reason to vote on the critique without an impact, that means you're voting on the gov for a dropped impact on advantage one, advantage two, just a quick synopsis of that, show how they're dropped, you know, or whatever. And then go judge on the critique. Impacts on the top. 
All I'm going to do is show you how we impact turn this critique. And that proves the critique is insufficient or the critique is a bad idea. Because of that, the only thing you have to vote on now is the app. And then dive on it, right? Like PMRs, you want to get small. Like I think the, how did, it was shown to me in this manner. We'll just do this. We don't care about should we do CTPT. It's done. All right. Oh, that's the internet, so screw them, right? Okay. So you have like your PMC here, right? You have your MG, and you have your PMR. You start off with a lot of information, a lot of new positions, and you want the debate to get smaller at the PMR. That way, you can have a framework, right, for the judge to evaluate it, and you want it to be small and concise. What this does is this also makes it so that the arguments on the opposition, usually you want them to fall outside of the framing or what is important in the round. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we have, you know, MOs and PMRs that are making the debates bigger, right? So if you have this, right, and you have a lot of information here, and somehow your PMRs are going bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger like this, it's just being done wrong, right? Judges hate that. When you start saying stuff in the MG or the MO, pull out a new sheet of paper, judges are like, I'm going to kill you. Judges are too late, like, not lazy. Yeah, most judges are pretty lazy. They just want to make the easy decision and they want to go back and help their teams win the next round. Like, make it simple for them. The more times you can give them, like, a really easy, very well explained reason on why you win the debate round and it comes down to something super simple and they can just line it up and vote on it, you are doing some awesome work. The judge sits there and has to go through 15 pieces of paper and go all the way over, cross-applying everything back and forth. They're just not going to do it. Right? Or they are going to do it, and they're going to be pissed. So you want to kind of streamline your arguments in, in your PMR. And that's why on the critique, you want to win certain battles. So look, on the framework, all I've got to prove on the framework of the PMR is either I can leverage my app against the critique, the framework is bad and we should look towards, uh, and, and we should frame them out of the debate, right? Or why the PERM grants on net beneficial level uh, that we can weigh the net benefits of, the discursive net benefits of the PERM as well as the impacts on case as a tiebreaker, right? Just quick, three, three things. Then you want to go to, you know, the PERMs. And that's where you spend your money on the debate. But go deep. Lots of comparison claims, lots of inevitability claims, lots of specific things to which what your perm does, right? I mean, a lot of times your perm will so solve a lot of the critique, but it might not solve all of it. And if it doesn't solve all of it, do a couple things. Explain why the critique can't solve for that portion. Or say why solving the other portion, the other 85% of the critique and one of the advantages or the impacts to the app both of those outweigh the small portions of the critique you cannot solve, right? Same with the counter plan, right? If it's a counter plan and you permit, you probably won't throw up all of the counter plan, but you solve most of the counter plan. So you want to bring it up with the PMR. You want to talk about why the perm resolves most of it, or or, or the part in which the counter plan, you know, or, you know, the counter plan can't solve, right? And then start making those distinctions. Like our our plan, we have this much solvency. It's quite a bit. Their counter plan only solves like 30%, which is this little spot here. When we permit, we solve almost all the dissat except for the small little impact and say what it is. And then compare them. Look, like, yeah, you're right. We might miss 100 voters, but we get not only the policy passed, we also increase voter agency, and we have a better turnout than if we never ran our plan at all. So that small amount that's still missed, while yes, it's sad, and we wish we could get them in this debate round, it's just not going to outweigh all the benefits we have everywhere else, right? Get real specifics, but I mean, this, I mean, <laughs> this could also be kind of like a debate, right? Like we start off and we know nothing and we just talk about our life experiences. Then we learn a bunch of jargon and all we say is stuff like dehume and extinction and nuclear winter and rehume. 
Uh, otherization is another one that we just say, right? And then I learned as I got better, I got back to getting real specific and broad again. Like, what, what's dehumanization in this case? Oh, we feel that dehumanization in this case is when we take a population, like if, say, we take a population and we say, we don't care about you anymore, and we cut off your water, we cut off your utilities, we make it so you have to bathe out of a bucket, we take away your ability to have crops and food sources, so now you are starving, you have things like food anxiety. Also, when we put you in prison in order to uh, execute you, we put a black bag over your head, which then makes you faceless. We feel this is uniquely dehumanizing because we have to make you look less than human in order to kill you. This justifies all that. That sounds way better than just being like, yo, bro, dehum. <laughs> no, bro, I'm just going to go sit down, right? And it doesn't help you. It does nothing for you. So you want to get into those very specific stories. And also, I've seen the PMR have some narratives, right? Tell, us, tell a story of something that happened, an individual story. Given a cohesive narrative of how your vantage functions. Easy. Judge. You can, you can understand this. Anyone can. The economy sucks balls. It's horrible. It's terrible. We make the economy better by allowing for more jobs in the green tech society, like we've shown what happened in, you know, some other country somewhere else, more and more and more. Then we can get these impacts. We can do these specific things, as we've seen in this population, or we've seen here. We've got this narrative story. When you look at that, their best answer on, on the diss ad is North Korea is going to nuke us. It's not going to happen, right? They're not going to nuke us over green technology. If anything, this type of technology can be exported and we can come up with better coalitions. We can release this empire talks. This fuels our ability to get the uniqueness on, you know, some sort of turn somewhere, right? Start using those narratives. For the last couple of minutes, could you talk about just general, like, grandstanding confidence things, like things that you think just make your PMR come out as, yeah, presentation-wise? Yeah, for sure. The first thing is, is, uh, who has paper? I hate when people, and judges hate when people do like this. This is, L is done, LOR is done. Oh, did you have that? Okay, we're going to go T, T, enter, K. No, no, no. In, uh, perm, add one, add three. No, no, no. Okay. Go up with a strategy and look like you're ready to just kill someone. I mean, there are times where, as a power move, I would be so ready the second the LOR was done, I was like this, and as soon as the timer goes off, it's like this. Order. Order is going to be T, the perms, the framework, advantage one, you ready, I don't care, let's go. <laughs> right? And just look like you own the room. Look like you are ready. Look like you are confident in what you are going to do. Shuffling around papers, changing the order around just makes it look like you don't even know what you're winning. Right? Some things I do in the LOR, because you have the LORs as prep time, right? So if you're the PMR, you want to make sure that your MG is listening for new arguments. You want to make sure your MG is uh, like seeing how they frame the debate, and you also want the MG to write down preempts that you might be missing, okay? Because you want to answer those preempts, okay? What you want to be doing is you want to sit there and you want to ask yourself, what do I need to win? in this debate to win this round. That could be arguments, that could be advantages, that could be perms, right? Then you want to ask yourself, what, what, like that, we're talking about big pieces, right? And then you want to say, now what little pieces do I need to win in order to win the big pieces? So what uniqueness points do I need to win or what uniqueness points do I have? Oh, grant me the links or, or, or what uniqueness do I have that will upset their link turn. We have a drop link turn, but if you can prove uniqueness is in the other direction, is no longer a link turn, right? Uniqueness controls the link. Or what impact do I want to get to? Do I have 
an individual link that has very little ink on it that I can blow up in order to get the impact I want. Okay? F figure out those things. Figure out comparative claims that you want to make. So if you need to win the perms, what perms you're going to go for, what net benefits you're going to go for, and do that. Um, the next thing I think confidence-wise that I think really helped me the most was have overviews on every piece of paper that you, that you want to bring up. Once I started uh, to judge some rounds, I realized that my train of thought is so different than other people's train of thoughts, right? And that goes for everyone. So instead of having a judge sitting there watching you piece things together bit by bit, just tell the judge. Like, judge, I'm gonna show that the, the uniqueness here it will lead to this link story here, and when we get that, we get full access to our advantage. Now let me start on the uniqueness. Look, this uniqueness claim here, here, and here gets us this. Because of that, we control the direction of the link, which means that their, li their link turns don't mean anything without uniqueness to them. They're parallel at best. You're always gonna take our specificity of this link here, here, and here, and because of that, we get this impact story. They try to take out this piece of it, but unfortunately, we still get to it because of our drop link story, and we get this, 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 and this. The judge knows what you're doing. Huge. Yeah, and the other thing too is sometimes, just, be, just from like a psychological standpoint, if you have the overview, the judge will fill that stuff in for you. And it's not because they're, they want to, it's just like a subconscious practice if you give it to them in the overview. And so I say put overviews on almost every piece of paper. I would also, you can um, use underviews from time to time. I'm more of an overview person. Other people will like to kind of go through the whole thing and give an underview at the bottom, but I kind of feel like overview is better because you kind of tell the judge what's going on beforehand and they can fill things in for you. Oh, um, but that's kind of a personal thing. Um, I also think that asking questions a lot um, after the round, like this is just a practice thing. Um, always ask, I, I learn, learn to make decisions. So either watch rounds and give a PMR, like fill the whole thing and give the PMR and then watch the PMR and see where you're different from really good debaters. Um, you can also do redos, so save your flow. Ask your adjudicator a couple things. What's the one argument that could have won me the round? What is the arguments that you thought we were winning overall in the debate? What are the arguments you think that we were losing in the debate? Um, how could we leverage those arguments? And what types of uh, claims do you think we could do better, right? Then take those back to your coach or back to someone that you know, or just take it to yourself and then just redo them. It's one of those things where you do them over. Like Joe Hyken is probably one of my favorite rebuttalists. That guy was amazing, amazing rebuttalist. And he said that even going into his, his last year, he was doing massive amounts of PMR redos and massive amounts of LOR redos and just getting familiar with them. Do you think those are especially necessary for the rebuttalist? Yeah, like, I don't understand, like, a lot of, like, really good, like, open debaters now, like, I don't know why it's a practice, at least I've seen a lot, is you do practice, but you, like, don't do rebuttals in practice, and I'm like, dude, rebuttals are hard, man, like, you gotta get that practice in, so just get that practice in, work hard on it, and then you can start throwing down that way, so, you guys have any other questions? Thank you. Cool, thanks, thanks guys, I appreciate your time. Nice.